Welcome, everyone. Robert, you're mute. <laughs> Why did this happen I love to me? That. I love that. <laughs> I could tell that right. you were very, very into it. I yeah. was so excited. Yeah, I was so excited for this one. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of Innovation Coffee. I'm Robert Wolf, joined by my co-host here, Alessandro Grande. And today, we have some really cool stuff to talk about. In fact, we're going to be meeting with Xinjin Fan and Larry Pang from IOTEX. IOTEX is not just a blockchain anymore because they have some really cool hardware devices that they have been building out. One in particular, the Pebble Tracker, which we're also going to be talking about. So in this episode, you get to hear a nice mix of blockchain, which is obviously a crazy buzzword that's been happening these last couple of years, and cool ARM-based hardware called the Pebble Tracker. So before we dive into that, before we meet our guests, let's talk about what we did last week. And Alessandro here is going to give us a quick recap. Thank you, Robert. Welcome, everyone. Um, so this is going to be the first episode I think we have on blockchain. So it's going to be interesting. I, I'm, I'm really excited to hear everything from IOTEX and what they've been working on. But before that, as Robert said, um, let's go through the recap. So Last week, we had a really fun episode with uh, the team from Avnet. So it was a team of uh, machine learning scientists and um, developers that actually built a double buddy or a machine learning or artificial intelligent um, double player that could play with you. And it was cool because they actually had um, different boards that they actually programmed um, or you know deployed the, the machine learning uh, inference models on. So it was quite cool to see that they actually, you know, differently from, from what I've seen in the past, they actually showed real power and uh, performance numbers that actually were comparing the different boards. And that was, uh, you know, something different, a bit more in depth than we've seen in the past uh, on other demos. So it was really fun. And uh, as usual, we'll put the link in the description and um, go check it out on our YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. Yeah, one of the cool things from last week that I just want to highlight, uh, my alma mater, and I mean alma mater like the previous company I worked for, uh, they had showcasing the 96 boards Ultra 96, so FPGA-based um, development platform, really cool, and um, it's exciting to see those things still being used. So uh, that was awesome, but yeah. Cool. So is it time? Is it time to bring in our guests? I think so. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so shall we introduce them first? So we have, uh, we're going to have with us Shinjin Fan, head of research, and Larry Pang, head of business development at IOTEX. Hi, Shinjin and Larry. Hello, welcome. Hi. Hello. Cool. So I think the first thing um, that we have to do here, right? Uh, we want to make sure that everyone knows who you are. Let's dive into introductions, the origin story of Larry and Shinjin. So we'll start with Larry, if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute or so, telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do for IOTEX. And you might want to mute yourself so we could go for <laughs> the second in a row today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, really, really great to be jumping on uh, Innovation Coffee with the ARM developer community. I got my favorite cup of Joe from Verve in uh, the Bay Area here. Um, so cheers to, the, cheers to that. Um, my name is Larry. I had a business development at IOTEX. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, went to school at MIT, graduated in 2013, uh, and studied business and finance there. And after that, um, you know, they say when you don't know what you want to do out of college, you go into consulting. So that's exactly what I did. I worked at Oliver Wyman, which is a strategy consulting firm, for about five years, actually, and did about 15 projects, mostly focused on digital transformation for large financial utilities, banks, etc. And through that really got to understand the enterprise landscape, you know, how they make decisions, uh, how they budget for things. Um, and that was a really great kind of grad school for me in more of a professional business context. Uh, but I really was searching for, you know, um, working with these old enterprises, uh, kind of dinosaur technology. Uh, we started to dabble into some of the future trends and blockchain was one of them that they were considering for some clearing infrastructure. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, that, that's why I jumped into IOTEX. I started here about three years ago, and it's just really incredible to see uh, the progress that we've made. So happy to dive into all things IOTEX uh, later on this call. All right, awesome. and so now it's time for you, Jinjin. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Jinjin Fan, uh, head of research at IOTEX. Uh, actually, I re received my PhD from Univers University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, we specialize in cryptography and uh, 
uh, uh, yeah, uh, and applied information security. Uh, yeah, later on, I, I lead a few government-based projects uh, with emphasis on the security and privacy aspect. Uh, and uh, I joined the, the Bosch research uh, in a couple of years ago, uh, working on the cloud security, IoT security, automotive security, and many yeah, different products. Uh, I jumped into IoTex in the very early days uh, when the company was founded. Uh, and since then, I have been, I have been leading the uh, research activities and development activities in terms of the blockchain uh, and uh, uh, and the different type of hardware. Yeah. Nice to share experience with all the audience here. Thank you. I, I think that we're well equipped with both of you here uh, to cover pretty much everything IOTEX. Um, yeah. I like what you, uh, I think you referred to both of you as, what was it? Qualitative and technical, or yeah, qualitative and technical, right? We're covering the, both the business side and the technical side of the IOTEX um, uh, efforts. So Jason, very cool. Uh, dynamic duo, you know, we'll, we'll cover yeah. all the cases here. The dynamic duo, there you and go. It, and if I may jump in actually real quick, I think it's interesting because usually like, you know, on this on these shows, we don't cover business side uh, or, you know, business um, at all, but we just cover the technical side. But actually, because it's blockchain, uh, it is about also like kind of creating value and creating uh, data, right? So it's, uh, and sharing data or, uh, so we're going to dive into that, but it's uh, it's really interesting. And thank you, Larry, for Larry and Shinjin for joining today. Uh, I'm really excited. Definitely. Nice, nice. Yeah. So um, I think the first step here, now that we've gotten to know you a little bit, everyone watching can kind of you know get to know you. Some people in the chat already are familiar with you and thanking you for your support and Telegram stuff like that. Um, let's get to know Iotex, the company, and and what you do, you know, as a high level. So um, I think you said you had a, a presentation to share. Did you want to get that going there, Larry? Just a couple slides. Yeah, just to give you the flavor of what Iotex does. Uh, but I'm going to jump right into it here. So, you know, Iotex, just to start, you know, uh, we're an open source platform. We got started in 2017. And we have a vision for what's called the Internet of Trusted Things, right? We want to make an open network, uh, permissionless, where all humans and machines can uh, kind of interact with guaranteed trust and privacy. You know, I would say our mission is really to enable everyday people and businesses to own and control their smart devices, as well as the data and value that they generate, right? Um, so we've designed our platform completely from scratch. Those that are familiar with blockchain understand the concept of forking protocols. We didn't fork anything, built it completely for scr from scratch and really tailor fit to, to be uh, connect real world devices to the blockchain, right? And that consists of multiple layers. Um, you know, for those that want to check out our code, github.com slash IOTEX project. Uh, but it includes blockchain, includes IOT middleware, includes developer tools to make building with blockchain easier, right? So the protocol is open source. We've written our own consensus mechanism. But what really differentiates IOTEX is how we layer on core IOT middleware and dev tools uh, to make uh, these use cases possible that we're going to talk about throughout this call, right? So. Uh, very core components like decentralized identity. We have a DID spec for not only humans, but also devices to allow them to kind of interoperate. Uh, we have decentralized storage. We dabble a lot in secure hardware and confidential computing, uh, which is built into the Pebble Tracker device that we're going to be talking about. And you know, across the board, we have a lot of software development kits, IDEs, and also just kind of uh, services that uh, really enable builders to get started on IOTEX. Uh, whether they're beginners or advanced developers, right? Um, I also want to highlight that, you know, IOTEX is very research-backed. Um, Xin Xin on the call here is actually the co-chair of the Industrial Working uh, Industrial Internet Consortium's Blockchain Working Group, alongside representatives from Amazon and Huawei. Uh, he's also leading some standards bodies within the IEEE on identity and just a general blockchain IoT framework. And IOTEX is a company. We work with chip, chip manufacturers and device manufacturers we partner with Nordic Semiconductor and WiseKey, uh, who do you know uh, cellular IoT kind of fabulous semiconductors, as well as WiseKey Moore's on NFC NFC tag kind of side of things. And we also work with device manufacturers to build products kind of like UCAM, right? It's a consumer facing camera, uh, but the focus today is going to be more on the secure hardware, uh, ARM Trust Zone enabled uh, technologies there. Um, and you know, this is just kind of a general uh, overview of what the platform is, kind of uh, visualizing what I shared on the previous slide. Uh, but really what our goal is at IOTEX is again, enabling trusted data from trusted devices to feed trusted applications, all verifiable, all open source. And we really think this is the architecture of the future. 
uh, at least for certain types of use cases. So hopefully that's a nice high level intro in the IOTEX, but we'll, we'll dive in more throughout the call. I, I think that that was great actually. And, you know, I love hearing it, that last block there. I mean, all the blocks are obviously important, but I love hearing about the developer enablement. To me, I think that's very important. You know, projects that, that are community oriented, that focus on making sure the developer experience is there um, and a good one um, uh, are, are usually the best ones to, to be involved in and to work on. So mm -hmm. um, definitely really cool. We, we already uh, have... Sorry. No, I was just going to say a quick, a quick uh, couple of uh, things from the chat. So we had, a, we have a couple of uh, friends, I think, from, from uh, you know, uh, from IATEX. Um, but also we've got uh, iShot JR uh, that actually attended one of uh, your uh, workshops at IoT Dev Summit that we did. In, uh, uh, oh man, it was two years ago now. Like it's, it feels yeah. like it feels less because of COVID, but but it was two years ago in uh, in Mountain View. Actually, we, that was a fun a fun workshop. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Definitely. It was a Mountain View at the Computer Science History yeah. Museum. I yeah. saw that workshop very well. Xin Xin was the one that delivered it. Oh gosh. I didn't Ooh. even, I mean, I was there. I, I don't, I, I didn't have time to go into barely any of the workshops. I wish I had more time when I was there, mm -hmm. but that would have been a cool one to see. Definitely. Um, awesome. So moving on to the first topic here and I like have my list of things here. We got to know the IOTEX as a company. Um, I would really like to kind of touch on, because we're going to build this up a little bit, right? Like you have IOTEX, the blockchain, you have IOTEX, the hardware designer, you have IOTEX, the developer enabler. Let's start from kind of the base, right? IOTEX, the blockchain, because this is the thing that all of these devices that we're going to end up talking to are going to communicate with in some way to transfer that data in, log it, and, you know, catalog it. So um, what is IOTEX, the blockchain? Could you kind of give us a little overview of that, how it functions, maybe touch on the governance model, whatever you'd like to do there? Definitely. Shinshin, you want to tackle this one? Uh, okay. So, yeah, IOTEX blockchain is a more LT-focused blockchain. Uh, so in terms of the governance model, we have the, uh, uh, the, the consensus we are using is called delegated uh, proof of stake. Uh, and also we have, uh, which means we have a large uh, community running the nodes uh, globally. And we randomly select the, the certain number of nodes we are running consensus for, for a certain period of time. Each, yeah, each time they, they are going to produce a block and uh, yeah, and later on uh, the, uh, the community will randomly change uh, to, the, to the next batch. Uh, this is a, it's a governance mode, uh, mode we are currently have. Uh, so it's quite decentralized. Uh, the, we, we have uh, almost 100 uh, delegates uh, globally uh, distributed. And uh, yeah, they are collaborated to, to ensure the security and safety uh, of the entire, entire blockchain. So yeah, that, that, that's basically about the, uh, the IOTEX blockchain. Uh, about the basic blockchain layer, we have the identity layer. Uh, to handle the uh, the identity uh, and uh, between yeah identity of people and the Internet of Things, uh, which means also device uh, to how how to deal with identities as well as uh, uh, some security services associated with that. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, yeah. Also, we have the confidential computing layer, uh, which will be used to handle uh, more privacy uh, sensitive applications. Uh, so that's basically three uh, major layers uh, we, are, uh, we are currently have to enable the developer uh, to, uh, to yeah, conduct uh, the different type of experiment and uh, to develop the more uh, decentralized and privacy focused applications. Definitely. You know, just to tack on a little bit to that, you know, I think uh, around the incentives part of blockchain, right? For those that are new to kind of this public, public blockchain sphere, you know, there's the, there's the distributed ledger aspect of it which is kind of the, uh, of the back end system, you think about it as a distributed database. But really what makes blockchain special is the ability to add uh, pre-programmed incentives to basically you know, establish operating rules across the different stakeholders of the network, right? So the stakeholders of the network include people that use the blockchain and spend tokens to transact uh, with smart contracts, to send payments, et cetera, but also the maintainers of the blockchain, right? So when you hear about all these tokenomics and incentives, it's really about how do you incentivize people to maintain the blockchain and how do you incentivize users to kind of create that virtuous cycle, right? So um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, it's like, to me, it's a beautiful blend of economics and technology together uh, is how I would characterize blockchain. 
I've, I've always liked, uh, you know, Carlo comments here, proof of stake greater than proof of work. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with those two terms, I'd suggest searching them because I'm pretty sure we could talk about this kind of stuff for hours and debate it out. Um, but I also favor the proof of stake model. And, um, you know, I would imagine that your blockchain, I haven't used it, is, is fairly fast because if you're talking about, you know, 100 representatives or 100 nodes um, instead of tens of thousands, <laughs> uh, I'd imagine that you're moving pretty fast there. So uh, that data is, is, is moving fast. Cool. So we talked about those three layers, right? Uh, thank you, Jinjin, Jin, for sharing the three layers and then adding to that, Larry. Um, but now let's talk about the pebble and the interface or the interaction between this blockchain space and the analog world. Because, um, you know, I think that this is still just such an innovative space right now. People have kind of mastered the whole blockchain space. People have kind of mastered this whole decentralized application space and they got these decentralized apps, smart contracts, all this good stuff. Again, if you <laughs> not familiar with my jargon, go search it. But let's talk about this interface between the hardware and the software because I don't think that this has been talked about enough yet in the blockchain space. So let could you, could you tell us what the Pebble Tracker is and then we'll dive into how it interfaces with your blockchain. All That's, right. Yeah, go ahead, Xinxin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one is Pebble Tracker uh, in my hand. Uh, it's a very smaller as, uh, trusted asset tracking device uh, you can use for, for multiple purposes. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a build surrounding the, the, the Nordic RF9116, uh, the, the system in, in package. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this Nordic uh, SIF basically features the Cortex M33 low power microcontroller uh, with trust, trust zone enabled. Uh, more importantly, they also include uh, the crypto cells 3, uh, 3, 310 uh, from the ARM. Uh, by combining uh, these two essential components, you can build uh, the highly trusted uh, applications for your, uh, for, your, for your IoT solution. Uh, this one is, uh, uh, they support the, uh, the both MB-IoT and LTM. Uh, yeah, cellular communication, and uh, they integrate uh, the RF part, uh, the com the microcontroller, uh, the GPS, uh, in into a very smaller small package. I think that yeah, this is a uh, this is a Pebble Tracker, and we already integrate uh, multiple sensors on this board, uh, including the environmental sensor from Bosch, uh, and the motion sensor from TDK, and some light sensor as well as a buzzer. Uh, which enable a developer to do all kinds of uh, hacking or uh, development. You uh, use this board. Larry, yeah. did you want to did you want to add to that one? I do, I do. You know, I think she right. gave a really great deep dive into the guts of it. But you know, at the core of what Pebble Tracker is, the philosophy behind it is combining tamper-proof hardware with tamper-proof software. So secure elements and blockchain, right? And that is really a powerful concept. If you can prove where your data came from, and you can uh, kind of hash it to a blockchain and also uh, prove the execution of that data and audit the, the traceability of it, then it becomes very, very, very important uh, as far as these end-to-end -end trusted solutions uh, to battle the misinformation that's really plaguing a lot of the industries of our day today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I really like this, this idea here. Um, you know, we, you, you touched on, on blockchain and for, for those of you who are familiar with this, you know, you, you, you're basically kind of moving away from a central controlled entity. Right. And I kind of want to touch on this just a little bit because, you know, if, if I were to just tell you right now, like, Hey, I'm going to ship this thing to you. Right. And UPS is going to tell you that that item left my house and it's going to be logged in every single location that it stops on its way to Larry, say I shipped something across the country to Larry and mm -hmm. we're trusting UPS, which is fine. You know, like a lot of people are fine with trusting UPS. Um, but let's talk about kind of like the shift, the shift from moving this, this, uh, this data from a, a centralized entity to a decentralized entity and why that's important. So maybe Larry, you can talk about this. Why, why is it important to, um, why is the decentralized aspect important in, in these types of applications? Definitely. You know, I'm going to throw some terminology out there, but I think it's important to differentiate. You know, there's a lot of talk about Web 1.0, Web 2.0, Web 3.0, right? So Web 1.0 are these open standards that, you know, the Internet was built upon, TCP IP, DNS, HTTPS, et cetera, uh, starting in the 90s and even earlier. 
And what happened in the 2000s, you started to see a lot of companies build proprietary tech stacks on top of it, right? The fangs of the world, Google, Apple, Facebook, et cetera, building very centralized silos on top of Web 1.0 and calling it Web 2.0, right? Uh, over the past 20 years, this has really shifted the entire landscape of how we interact with devices and just interact with the internet, right? Um, but now we're at a point, we're at a tipping point where especially consumers and everyday businesses are starting to realize, okay, why do I have centralized parties custodying my data, especially because that data has more and more value as you know the world becomes more digitized, right? So the vision of Web 3.0 uh, is not just a buzzword. It's all about a uh, user-centric way to replicate the functionality of Web 2.0, but delivering value back to users, right? And this is really what blockchain is all about. It starts with the concept of ownership, right? Um, the, the concept of the, the mantra kind of popularized by Bitcoin is your keys, your funds. So when you apply that mantra to our smart devices, we're really applying that to bring a your keys, your data uh, type of uh, philosophy. So, you know, yeah. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to take a step back in uh, and talk about uh, quickly about the the security, the hardware security, because I think that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. you know, my job is to you know kind of tell people about new technology and and kind of you know kind of excite people about new technology and get them to use it, right? And and in a lot of cases, when you talk about security, people are kind of approach security as an afterthought, right? Like they start building. Uh, stuff that works and then they're like, oh, you know, I should make this probably secure, right? So you, there's a lot of software security, you know, things that you can do from a software perspective. But actually, you know, you mentioned it earlier, um, there are a lot of like hardware standards that are uh, becoming more prevalent now. And I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, you're using an M33 and uh, that's that's a new, it's fairly new chip uh, chipset that has come out uh, that's got Trust Zone uh, because it's a V8M architecture, right? And it takes advantage of a hardware separation layer. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is that it's always hard to like kind of sell to a developer the concept of, you know, you should you should look at how the device has been built, right? Because actually, to some extent, the developer is kind of very abstracted away, right? And it doesn't really need to know that a device is built in a certain way. But I love what you guys are doing because you're building on top of that security, hardware security layer, than a software security layer, right? And and blockchain and, and so on. So it's quite interesting how you're kind of almost like I want to say like making security sexy, right? It's like it's like yeah. if there wasn't if there wasn't the security layer, you couldn't do what you were doing, right? So it's uh yeah it's actually quite interesting that uh, you're making a real use of it beyond the obviously you know everything should be secure because otherwise uh, we're going to end up being in a lot of trouble in the future. Uh, but it, it's, it doesn't work that way, right? Like there's a lot of stuff that still is not super secure. Um, so I really like your approach that you're taking. So I wanted to actually ask maybe Xinjin to like touch a little bit more on, um, you know, perhaps like the, I don't know, like what um, what trusted OS are you using? Are you using any, um, any, any kind of open source trusted OS? Um, or are you, did you build your own? Yeah, That's and so, let's add to that too while you're while you're answering that question. So what OS, what trusted OS, but also you know what what are you doing to enable the developers you know who okay. work on these types of things? So maybe you can like double double tag that. Yeah. So yeah, basically Nordic provide the complete open source uh, the SDK, uh, which we, uh, very easy for developers to, to use uh, working on the Nordic chip. Uh, so in terms of the the OS, uh, the uh, currently Nordic SDK running the Zephyr. Uh, that's uh, also an open source, uh, open source OS have been audited by yeah by, by other companies. Uh, so uh, therefore, actually, uh, is very active in the security domain. Also, uh, they are they are, they will integrate like the trusted firmware. That's a very essential piece uh, for for enable all kinds of security services, right? So ARM provide a very nice uh, uh, hardware chip like Cortex M33. Uh, you can do the uh, separation. Um, yeah, between the secure secure world and the normal world. Uh, yeah, the crypto cell uh, even enhance the security, right? You can do all the crypto accelerations using hardware chip and the key can be securely stored. Uh, and uh, and when you use that key, that key only can be directly accessed by the crypto cell, uh, bypass, the, bypass the CPU. Uh, I think that's a very essential feature uh, when you deal with all the security, uh, security sensitive operations. Uh, yeah, about that, 
uh, the trusted uh, trusted firmware further enable uh, you to have all kinds of security services. Uh, you can doing the secure boot uh, on your on your security device. Enable only trusted uh, yeah, firmware image can be run on your device. Uh, you can doing uh, you can further do the testation to show the um, sh to show that people actually your device running in the in the in the status you are they are supposed to be. Uh, above that, you can do the secure uh, data storage uh, and the secure auditing. I think that's all the essential uh, security services. Uh, yeah, you need to implement when you consider uh, the yeah to secure your IoT solution and the device. Uh, above that, uh, as we are yeah we are we are also dealing with blockchain, right? So we uh, we can also an anchor certain security critical event or status onto blockchain, which will add an additional layer. Uh, of security on top of the uh, hardware and the so uh, and the software. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the SDKs too, Shishin, about the embedded and the uh, the the blockchain SDKs. Yeah. So uh, uh, in terms of the hardware side, as I mentioned, the the Nordic provides open source SDK. Uh, we 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 did further customize uh, customization in terms of our requirements and uh, some. Uh, also, we have our own uh, embedded SDK. Uh, for to to enable the uh, the pivot tracker to interact with blockchain, uh, of course it's a it's a multi multi stage uh, yeah multi stage work uh, to further enable uh, the the interaction between the hardware and the blockchain. Cool. So so let's 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 real quick. I, uh, Alessandro, I think wants to take some questions here from the chat, but I I want to just kind of first drive this point home because. Shinjin, you you just you just kind of gave us a, a bunch of technical stuff that, that we can you know mull over and think about for a while here. Can we kind of take everything you just said and kind of plug it into a use case to kind of better understand this entire cycle here, right? So um, either you or Larry, uh, I really wanted to talk a little bit about the supply chain use case. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about all the way from top down or bottom up how would the Pebble Tracker be used in this use case? And this is also going to address one of the questions in the in the YouTube chat because they were actually asking what's a what's a good use case for the Pebble Tracker. So I'm I'm throwing that out to you. You have the Pebble Tracker. You have the IoTex blockchain. How could we use this in a supply chain situation um, all the way through? Yeah, I can, I can start. Maybe you know I think going back to what I said earlier about tamper-proof hardware plus tamper-proof software. The result of both of those things, the common denominator is verifiability, right? So these days when we have such multi-stakeholder processes, take supply chain, for example, right? It's not just a multi-stakeholder process, but it's a string of multi-stakeholder processes, um, some of which uh, require uh, interactions with competitors that you do not trust, right? So that's the big problem statement. How do we get people that don't trust each other to trust each other? In today's world, intermediaries are hired, right? Centralized intermediaries that take a big cut and all they do is establish a single version of the truth, right? Because we all trust this single entity, which is error prone and maybe manipulative, um, then we can trust the entire supply chain. But what we're doing is kind of replacing that error prone uh, human intermediary with an unbiased uh, device and an unbiased platform that can execute different commands uh, completely verifiably, right? So that's the real important part. As we get to a, a, a stage in our world where, you know, we really have to reevaluate who we trust and why we trust, uh, blockchain and secure hardware can provide a really unbiased single version of the truth that's not only trusted because of reputation, but is trusted because anyone can go back and verify it, right? And that's very, very, very powerful. And to me, I think that's the foundation for a lot of aut automation type of use cases, right? Without having a verifiable single the wor single version of the truth to work on, then at every step, you're gonna have to take a pause and then reestablish trust, right? Okay, let's all review the data. Let's all make sure it's, it's good before we move on. But if we ever dream about, you know, the automated supply chains of the world, the really fully digitized versions of it, uh, we still have a long way to go because supply chains are operating on manual bill of ladings and such today. But in the future, five to 10 years from now, I believe that blockchain registered secure hardware devices that you know, are tamper proof by nature and designed to just be kind of unbiased robot workers um, 
passing data to a verifiably trustworthy blockchain that can execute business logic via smart contracts in a fully verifiable way, you can start to see how, you know, it's, it's building upon this point of verifiability um, to really, yeah, to really bring trust and a lot of uh, new opportunities and new business models and engagement models, right? And that's what's really exciting about this blockchain and IoT space is we're not really trying to fix the old system. We're almost trying to build a brand new system that is, uh, you know, user respecting, it's fully verifiable, it's also open source. And, you know, I think it's just the start. So when you think about IOTEX, you think about devices like Pebble Tracker, um, it's easy to just think about, okay, asset tracking, remote monitoring, but you should think about this as a platform, right? What can we do with verifiable data? What type of human intermediaries, what kind of error prone processes can we replace with absolutely trusted technology, right? So I think that's where the real big opportunity is, is exploring this new brand new uh, kind of way of thinking about how we can design the world. Everything's connected. Everything is trusted by a decentralized exactly. verification. I, I, I like that. And I mean, um, I think well, in the green room before the show started, we were also talking about creating these sensor networks where you can contribute to these networks and you, you were you know, touching on this. But I mean, I love that idea. Right. And, you know, finding a reward model for people who um, can, you know, essentially tap into a uh, uh, community of people who are trying to provide information or data on pollution, right? So that we can make the world better. Even and we talk about supply chain as one of the applications, but I mean, this could be, you know, IOTEX pebble tracker um, with all of the sensors on board, tracking pollution in a city and, you know, contributing all this to a, a again, a, a, a trusted network of, you know, decentralized con contributor, a decentralized network of, <laughs> of contributors, right? Yeah. So there you exactly. go. Yeah. I would love to I would love to tackle that a little bit. You know, I think that what's really interesting with these with these opportunities is that, you know, as you said, contributors can now become shareholders. Right. And this all starts with ownership. Right. Once you own your data outright, then you can decide what to do with it. You can keep it absolutely private. You can uh, use it to trigger a smart contract on blockchain or this concept that we call kind of data collectives. Right. A lot of people ask us, you know, well, why do I want to own my data? It's not worth anything today. Right. But that's maybe somewhat true, but you can extract value from that data, especially in the aggregate, right? Just to give you an example of Waze, right? Waze is a completely crowdsourced oh, yeah. uh, digital map where people tag mm -hmm. potholes, uh, tag different things, and really add value to what's just a bare bones map. Waze was sold to Google for $1.2 billion in 2013. It's probably upwards of multi-billion dollar valuation today. but where is the value for the people that helped create the map, right? Why do the why do the contributors to the final product not own a piece of the final product, or at least a dividend or a royalty or something like that, right? So this concept of bringing together many people with verifiable data uh, to kind of string together these data collectives, whether it's a uh, you know five pebble trackers at uh, a university that are creating a decentralized air quality index, where someone wants to access that index or read it, maybe they pay a small amount. And that trickles down to uh, the people that contributed to it or are actively maintaining it, right? Uh, the other thing is uh, we're working with a really cool machine learning company uh, called Scaleout, and they want to train machine learning models using the verifiable data from Pebble Tracker and kind of decouple the machine learning uh, model creation process, right? A lot of the times it's the same entity collecting the data, building the model, and uh, building the predictions, right? But decoupling that allowing anyone to contribute to these data collectives and be shareholders in that. This is something that only is possible on blockchain today, right? But still in its infancy, but we really invite everyone that's interested in these concepts to, to talk to us, join the active data collectives and even start your own, so. I'm, I'm interested to say real quick, if, if, if anyone does get access to one of these Pebble trackers um, and you know cruise on back to this video and drop you know, your experience, what, what you built, you know, share with us the cool stuff that you're doing with it in the comment section. So, you know, come on back to the video and, and, and then ping us so that we can then share it in the network and share it over with Larry and, and Jinjin. So um, that'd be cool. Anyone working on the pebble. Do you mind if oh, I do one, one quick plug really fast while you say that, you know, uh, I'm uh, the, the pebble tracker is available for, for sale right now. It's on crowd supply, uh, which is the, one of the leading hardware crowdfunding platforms, right? 
Um, and this is, uh, you know, we already have over, I think, uh, 110 backers and there's still two weeks left to purchase this, right? So we have a lot of great updates in here. I'm not going to go through all of it, but uh, we talk about, you know, what kind of next gen decentralized IoT applications Pebble can fuel. Uh, we talk about, you know, how we evolved Pebble from a version one in 2020 to a version two in 2021. And then finally, we talk about these concepts of how we can kind of build these data collectives on IOTEX, right, across machine learning models, across geospatial maps, across crowdsourced climate indices. So just so many exciting initiatives that are just starting to get off the ground uh, with Pebble. And it's a really great community, you know, 100 plus developers already on board. So it's not just you're buying a device and you have to build uh, solutions just on your own individually, you can join an active community of devs that is thinking about these things. Also, awesome. thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was actually going to say, um, you know, if you do come back to us and you tell us what you build, perhaps we could do another episode uh, where we do talk about, you know, the builds that happened, right? So that'd be fun. Um, I also wanted to take address some of the questions that we had in the in the chat. Um, so guys, get ready for the questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we have no so control one, over this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're ready. We're ready. The first one is uh, is simple. I mean, I think we touched on this, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate on this. Um, so, what are the use cases for Pebble Tracker for individual users? So, I guess that maybe you know to reinterpret this, if I understand it correctly, it's about like okay, I'm not interested in perhaps uh, you know kind of contributing or participating with others. I'm interested, uh, or maybe I'm not interested in a lot of devices. I'm just interested in maybe a few devices. So, what can you do with that? And I think you touched on upon it. You touched upon it already, but floor is yours. Go ahead, Chi. I'm gonna I'm gonna post uh, I'm gonna share my screen really fast. It's just like a visual reference about you know this kind of decision tree of how you can use the data from Pebble. But please yeah. go ahead, Chi. Yeah, I, yeah. Actually, uh, yeah. You, I, as shown by Larry on on, on these slides, you can Pebble provide a, a lot of sensors uh, for 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 different data different type of data collection. Uh, yeah, they basically have three categories. Uh, of, uh, of use usage, you can yeah you can you can keep your keep your data hundred percent private. Uh, for example, you can yeah based on the blockchain technology as well as security features uh, on the Pebble. Uh, you 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 can uh, you can put the Pebble on your on your home. For example, for personal users, we have the air quality sensors here, and right? you can monitor the air quality here uh, if you only want to use for your own purpose. Uh, yeah. Also, you can uh, yeah you can use Pebble to uh, to doing the uh, further data analysis and the machine learning. Uh, that's the other uh, type of uh, type of application. You can you can even treat your data uh, with with other uh, organizations or other peers they are interested. Uh, yeah, the third yeah the, the, yeah that's basically the the third category of uh, of uh, applications uh, regarding the monetization of your. Uh, your uh, IoT device. Definitely. You know, any kind of asset tracking or remote monitoring uh, use case can be bolstered by a Pebble Tracker, right? I think even replacing traditional asset trackers with a Pebble, it's already got more sensors on it, and you just get the extra layer of verifiability, right? Um, for things that require extra sensitive handling or, you know, things that are sensitive or uh, temperature sensitive. You know, a lot of these, these things is like if there's lack of trust in any part of your overall supply chain, Pebble Tracker could be a good way to reinforce uh, more trust into where it's missing today. Awesome. So we've got another question. Sorry, Robert, I wanted to pull up the other question, but if you want to go say anything else. Okay. Yeah. Just, just real quick, I guess, um, you know, we're talking about Pebble Tracker being used kind of in an industrial use case. Um, is the Pebble Tracker certified in any way to be used in like a, you know, consumer product can people can people actually use it in their in their you know what is it <laughs> yeah Custom so, product. product yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a very good question actually we are uh we are in the process of certification for pebble uh for different standard fcc uh ce and uh, and some others uh we are in the process for for getting all the certification uh for pebble yeah that's awesome thank you awesome mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Another question from the audience. Um, so Ulu is asking, how can we participate in this effort? Um, so aside from buying the Pebble, what can we do? How can we participate? 
I think that's a really interesting question, actually. Yeah, I can take this one. You know, I think that uh, just by participating is, you know, uh, obviously buying a Pebble and becoming part of these data collectives is very important. But even if you don't have the device, there's a lot of like bottoms up contributions that uh, is all is what blockchain is all about, right? Like uh, we touched a little bit about how blockchain consensus works today, right? It's a distributed group of nodes that collectively take turns mining blocks and uh, adding security to the network, right? Uh, this establishing that single version of the truth. But that's kind of at the base layer. There's also a, a kind of a concept of layer two or application focused consensus in tokenomics where you know there's going to be multiple types of stakeholders in these ecosystems right people that have a pebble tracker will kind of be the data providers or the data generators right but in the future maybe there's also a role of uh you know a manual data validator uh for things that are really not uh, as secure as pebble tracker right it's kind of the way that machine learning models are trained today it's kind of these recaptcha uh, type of tagging images annotations things like that um, and those can all be built into the incentive layers that we're talking about, right? Uh, that's really the beauty of blockchain is if you have all these stakeholders and you need to align them, you can pre-program the rules and the operating structures uh, in the tokenomics themselves, right? So when we think about these air quality indices or uh, these verifiable machine learning models, um, I think the direct way to participate in these efforts is to be a data contributor. But in the future, there's going to be more and more roles as far as, you know, even helping to establish the governance around uh, these these uh, uh, kind of ecosystems, right? That's the, uh, that's the last really important part of this is um, not only will the contributors become shareholders in the value of these digital assets in the future, but they also will be shareholders in the decision making process about you know how these tokenomics are refined, how uh, the pricing of the ultimate digital asset will be, and how that trickles back to the users, right? All these things are uh, collectively governed and a great example is, you know, the IOTEX blockchain is governed in this way already. But as we see more applications sprout on top of our platform, you're going to see the governance and the kind of the uh, the decentralization also exist at the application layer. So hopefully that wasn't too blockchain-y of an answer. <laughs> but, uh, I did my best there. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that was, that was great. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. it worked. Um, so I, I want to be conscious of, of time, Alessandro. Are there more questions there? Because Jinjin said he has a demo to show us, or at least kind of like a dashboard for the Pebble yeah. tracker. Mm -hmm. do, yeah, do, I think let's go. Questions? Let's go with that, and then we can take. There's another couple of questions on the, for, on the chat, but we can take them either during the demo or right after. So yeah, Jinjin, if you, I think it'd be awesome to see your your work, your demo. Yeah, let me share my screen. This is exciting. So maybe while you while you share your screen, maybe I can ask this to to Larry. Um, mm -hmm. So David is asking. There is also another question on this kind of similar topic. Um, is there um, ex examples or use cases that you've seen in the autonomous space that you thought about or that people are kind of considering? I think this is a perfect. This is one of my favorite blockchain use cases, by the way. Right. Um, just give an example of like the in the automotive space. Everyone knows that installing OEM hardware into a vehicle is like a five to seven to eight, 10 year process, right? So uh, Pebble Tracker is kind of like a third party attachment to your vehicle. You can start to track verifiably data such as, uh, you know, the speed, the acceleration, uh, you know, whether you hit a pothole. If you attach Pebble Tracker to your vehicle, this motion data, as kind of Shin Shin is showing our dashboard right now, uh, this motion data will be available to you, right? Um, the other really interesting thing that I think is once you apply the concept of Pebble Tracker as kind of a verifiable data generator with the concept of UCAM, which is a camera, right? Once you have verifiable dash cams and even, you know, Tesla vehicles, I saw so many news stories about, you know, if someone's trying to break into a car and the peripheral cameras around a Tesla catches that. Um, what's really interesting in the automotive space is how this translates to insurance companies, right? What do you need to prove to insurance companies where you know the claims process doesn't even have to exist anymore, right? We have unbiased devices that are providing us the truth. Why do we have to go back and uh, attribute fault and you know go through this teeth pulling claims process that I'm sure we've all experienced at some point in our lives, right? So it's all about first getting this data in a verifiable format. And once we have it on, on blockchain or even just using it directly in claims, 
then we can bypass a lot of these like trust uh, reestablishing exercises that are, are necessary in today's society. So that's a great question. I love the automotive space, uh, especially and insurance. Interestingly, you actually answered one other question from Single Finn. Uh, that was actually exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. So he was asking about uh, dash cam use cases and, uh, and how useful it could be for insurances. Um, so thank you for answering that as well. Yeah. Uh, Shinjin, you're yeah. up. Let, let's see it. So can, can you see my screen? <laughs> yes. OK, so yeah, actually, I just briefly talk about the from developer perspective, right? So the default firmware uh, for developer on the Pebble, uh, they will connect to uh, a number of open source product uh, or components. Uh, basically, they are hosting this, uh, all those components uh, on, yeah, on, on the cloud. Uh, once you power up the Pebble, uh, so the Pebble will directly uh, send the data through MQTT to the HMQ. Uh, that, that yeah, that's a, a MQTT uh, yeah pub sub server, and which will be further uh, transmitted to the things board uh, for uh, for visualization. Uh, all all those uh, open source components, I think most of the IoT developers are quite familiar. Uh, and uh, here you can see all the. Uh, all the different type of dimension data we are collecting. Uh, the map is not uh, not show here on purpose uh, because it will yeah directly uh, yeah know my location exactly. <laughs> uh, GPS here is very precise. I yeah I did configure uh, on purpose without showing the GPS data. Once you yeah once you click that, uh, you will show the map and the pin where you are exactly located, and you can yeah you can also see the like the the the, the beep. Uh, to 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 know where your pebble is, you, if you can, yeah, if you accidentally lost in somewhere at home, you can, yeah, you can you can be able to find the pebble. All the all the data here, uh, just continually, uh, yeah, showing here. Uh, they will send a sample, uh, data, um, yeah, uh, yeah, depending on your configuration. Uh, you can configure a few minutes, uh, or even yeah, a few seconds, uh, etc. Uh, but it will definitely affect the battery life. It's a it's a it's a mobile mobile device. Uh, for from the also uh, from the developer perspective, uh, it's very easy to doing the application development. Uh, you yeah the Nordic provide the uh, yeah yeah the, the Sager Embedded Studio, which are actually free uh, when you use a Nordic chip. Uh, also, uh, we have the micro USB here. You can you can plug in to here uh, connect to your laptop. Uh, and directly uh, flash the uh, firmware. Uh, basically, you you just uh, uh, need your Pebble goes into the MCU boot mode, uh, then you can easily flash a new firmware. Use uh, the tools uh, provided by the by the Nordic. It's a uh, once uh, yeah, uh, RF connect tools. Uh, you can uh, you can click the open the programmer, uh, then drop to your hex file uh, uh, into this programmer, then. Yeah, it will automatically done. It's very you don't need to uh, use uh, uh, use uh, G-Link or, or JTAG programmer for this. Just a uh, micro USB uh, in the MCU boot. You can do uh, all kind of flashing for your uh, different application. Yeah, I think that's a, a very brief uh, overview what you what you received uh, when you received the Pebble. What you are expected. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, very. There's a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Larry, no, go on. I was just going to say there's a lot of excitement in the chat, uh, but yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, you know, Shin Shin just showed a very customizable view of like how people can use Pebble Tracker, right? I think uh, the, 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 the firmware is completely open source. So again, if you're trying to design Pebble Tracker for some type of production use case, you really have to optimize the peripherals, optimize the, the operating kind of procedures of the device. But right out of the box too. We're trying to make this as easy as possible for even you know, the beginner developers, non-developers to get started, visualize their data, and just you know, experience uh, IoT uh, for the first time. I think you know, seeing the dashboard is one thing, but then seeing how the data flows across this ecosystem is definitely another thing. So uh, teaching by example, I think uh, getting people into this, this space well, one, one device at a time. So, Can I ask? Oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. Now, I was just going to ask a really silly question because, you know, I, I haven't seen, uh, we haven't talked about this before, but um, so you, you've got the data 
that your device is capturing and you can decide what to do with it effectively. But what about the dashboard itself? I mean, is that being, is that centralized? I mean, is that, where does that live? Uh, is, do you have a server that renders that data? How does that work? Yeah, so uh, actually for the for the developer, we uh, open, also open source uh, th this backend. We provide the Docker image. Uh, developer can directly pull from the, our GitHub. Uh, then they, they can start set up their own developer environment very quickly. Then they can yeah they, they can they can doing the all development work uh, in their local environment. Once it's uh, become production ready, they want to move to the cloud. We we also provide the detailed guidance how you uh, how you deploy this application. Uh, uh, use AWS, use uh, you, use the Google service or the Microsoft service. Uh, yeah, that that's just a part for for the IoT. Uh, application. So if you 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 are more interested in the in the blockchain uh, domain, we yeah we, we are also providing uh, uh, a, a number of tutorials uh, how you can uh, how you can do this uh, because you, you yeah you can choose to directly send your data to the to the blockchain or you can uh, you you can choose to still use store their data uh, on the cloud, but you anchor some kind of proof on the blockchain. Uh, to add additional integrated layer. It's really depending on the uh, real use case and the applications. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to flash to this uh, quick docs page, right? So there's tons of documentation. As, as Shin Shin mentioned, there's kind of two development modes. One is a hosted backend, which is a kind of very plug and play, very open source. You can also set up your own custom backend, uh, which, which you kind of call production mode, right? So depending on what you're using Pebble for, if you're trying to kind of plug and play, visualize data, prototype, the hosted backend is honestly a really great um, way to just point your data at any MQTT endpoint. Uh, but the production mode, you can really customize it to your needs. And we really encourage everyone to just dig through the documentation, right? docs.iotex.io, as well as our GitHub. As Shinshi mentioned, the firmware itself is fully open source. Just want people to dive in and play with it. The backend uh, is open source as well. And you know, this is a, our entire IOTEX project repository, right? It has the the source code, open source code for the, the blockchain itself uh, in Go um, has our decentralized identity protocol. Um, everything's open source, right? This is the spirit of blockchain, spirit of IOTEX is to, um, you know, put all the things out there and have people build with it. So that's what we're really excited to kind of take this philosophy we've done in the blockchain space for the past few years and now bring it to hardware. So excited for that. So I want to I want to tackle a question in the chat, but I only really want to tackle the first part of this question. Okay, so okay. I'm just going to pull it up here real quick. Vito, what if someone hacks the device? Okay, and I mean this is something that I mean even I'm curious about. I'm not a hardware engineer. I've never built something this intricate, and I know that on these you know TPM modules or these these hardware uh, uh, secure hardware modules, um, it would be very difficult. But I think it's still possible. So if you're talking about putting these IoT devices out in, out in the field, I mean, like, technically, couldn't someone get access to the chip, physical access yeah. to the chip, poke it and prod it until they get the information they need from it? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very, uh, very good question. Uh, actually, the Nordic chip, they achieved the PS1, uh, PSA uh, level one certificate. Which, which means they provide the certain uh, isolation on the hardware level. Uh, however, the ARM uh, defines three levels of uh, uh, certification in terms of the PSA, right? The platform, uh, yeah, application, uh, architecture, uh, yeah, uh, this standard. So uh, for the level three, I think they will uh, they will add more more restricted uh, testing in terms of the hardware tampering, uh, etc. So uh, yeah, once you go to the higher level, you need to uh, ensure your systems uh, have small uh, countermeasures against, uh, against a different type of threats. Uh, I'm not saying this one cannot be completely hackable. For example, uh, if you are uh, if you are familiar with all kind of set channel attacks, right? Either the power uh, power timing or electro electromagnetic field. Possibly after you gain in uh, enough number of the power trace. Uh, you you possibly can extract the key, uh, but we yeah from the countermeasure side we can also deploy all kinds of uh, countermeasure uh, to further block all this type of uh, hacking attempts. Uh, yeah, 
So I think it's always uh, the uh, the attack and shield, right? So depending yeah. on, <laughs> uh, yeah, depending on how we uh, uh, how we can further enhance the security and what's it, what's the real threat model for your application? Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, that's the first thing you need to you need to consider. Yeah. You can always put fail safe. Uh, oh, sorry, I was gonna say you always put fail safes in too, right? Like once a module has been tampered with, then that no longer that should no longer be counted towards the network, right? So like yeah. it's possible that there's fail safes put in there. Sorry, Alessandro. No, so no, I was just gonna say. Sorry, sorry, Larry. You're gonna say something. No, no, I was just saying security in layers, right? It's kind of the the multi yes. multi layered approach. And I was just going to build on what Shinjin just said about uh, platform security architecture, uh, PSA for short. And also, you you talked about um, um, the, the, basically the fact that you have to model your device and your use case in order to find what the threat is, right? So threat modeling uh, is kind of the first layer, you know, platform security architecture actually dictates that you do that uh, when you build your device. Because actually, you know, as you mentioned, it depends what the use case is, right? Like, I mean... You could potentially hack everything if you've got enough time and if you've got enough uh, enough resources. Uh, so it's, it really depends on what the use case is, what the uh, the threats are, and and uh, and you know it's it's always a cat and mouse chase, right? It's a it's a cat and guy and mouse game. Sorry, okay. uh, you know you always try to like stay ahead of the of the hackers. Uh, but I think it's uh, you know we're moving to a stage where hardware security is actually built in the chips now uh, on microcontrollers that wasn't real. You know, a few years ago. So you know, we've enabled that to to actually kind of enable these security uh, features on top, the software security layers on top, right? So, um, so it's it's exciting. I think we we're going to see more devices like this, and I, I love the guy. I love the fact that you guys are kind of taking advantage of this to the to the extreme, right? So it's it's really cool. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, I think we have one more question. Should we take that quickly? Um, uh, I want, yeah, I want to be conscious. I want to be conscious of time here. Let's take that question, but also yeah. Larry, Shinjin, while we take that, think about your your plug because you're going to get a moment here to to, <laughs> to also plug whatever you want. Absolutely. Um, I guess okay, maybe this one. Um, so how do you use the Pebble Tracker? Like install it or what? Is the Pebble Tracker required to be kept or installed in some specific location? Maybe we just remind everyone what the link to the docs is or the you know, documentation right or the website. Um, so that people can go to check that out. There Boom. we go. Yes, docs.io slash developer. But I think it's important yeah, to also say, you know, depending on what you use Pebble Tracker for, right? It's a very Swiss Army knife type of device, right? If you put it on a person, it becomes a, a verifiable person tracker. If you put it on inside of a package, then you can determine whether it was open from the light sensor, you can determine the location, the handling of it, then it becomes a very pure form of an asset tracker. If I left, if I attached it to my door when I was away, then it could be even like a motion sensor, right? A verifiable motion sensor. If I put it in the corner of my my room, it can become a smoke detector from the air quality sensor, right? The really important part is it's not about the sensors, it's not about the raw data, but it's about the insights that we can extract from this data in order to, you know, make us understand more That's about the world and how to automate it, right? Does does the okay? So IOTX IOTX is the governing coin for the IOTX blockchain. Do you have ways to issue tokens under this blockchain? Yes, and that's okay. the really important part, right? So those data collectives, what we're talking yeah. about. So yeah, so mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead, Robert. Oh, sorry, I just want I want to a, a, ask a question slash also maybe propose this to the community here. You know, I, I'm thinking uh, Pebble Tracker Medallion with the GPS enabled that the more you run and or move around, it starts feeding you tokens. So as you as you kind of like go around your city or do something, you get issued tokens. So rewarding for exercise, right? Get that stuff listed. Yeah. <laughs> so the well, applications are have a use case exactly like that. Yeah, we have a use case exactly like that. It's called Pebble Go. It's kind of like Pokemon ah, Go, right? Where there you go. a verified GPS location from your Pebble Tracker, if you say you visit the Statue of Liberty, then you can mint like these collectible NFTs, right? Um, oh, wow. So that's, like a, that's a really interesting way to have proof of presence, right? Uh, you know, every GPS signal can be easily spoofed, but this is tamper proof, right? And that's what the assurance from semi trusted to fully trusted can give you. You have the confidence to deliver coupons for people that enter your restaurant and can prove that they're actually there. Um, but also, you can mint uh, you know, the fungible tokens, not necessarily as like a data marketplace concept. 
but more around the uh, the more around to facilitate okay how do i denominate fractional ownership of these data collectives to people right so if i've contributed 50 percent of the value to a machine learning model then i'm going to have 50 percent of the tokens that represent the value of that digital asset right so uh, it's really about ownership for now, but as these assets grow, capture more network effects, then you're really much a shareholder in a growing asset itself, right? And that's all denominated by tokens, and you can launch them on IOTEX, and they're definitely coming with Pebble Tracker very soon. Yeah, I'm just thinking that's like a fun, a fun project for your family, like DIY project. Go launch a token, call it call it healthy family token, and then give each one of your kids a pebble tracker and your wife or your partner. And then literally as they go work out, they get issued tokens and those, those tokens can be returned to, to, you know, the owner for an allowance or um, I don't know, a trip to Disneyland. And it's like, all right, kids, exactly. with enough tokens I mean, and that's going to be a fun DIY project. You're speaking just, our language, man. <laughs> there you go. Just, yeah. just to build on this, actually, I think I think governments might actually, you know, buy something like this or even like corporations. I mean, seriously, no, I, I meant I meant actual or be involved in the actual uh, kind of this data collective specifically, right? Because I mean, right now we're all sitting at home all day, right? We're not moving. If we had an incentive to move, uh, you know, maybe you would move more. So I think it's it's really interesting. And it might be actually like, you know, you talk about health at a, at a kind of, um, you know, government level, it's a problem, right? If nobody, if everybody stops moving, uh, we become like the Wally film where everybody's like kind of on wheelchairs, like going around, right? But like, seriously, it could become a, a challenge uh, and this could be, you know, maybe an interesting solution. I just wanted to also, um, we're going to wrap up, but I just wanted to mention this comment from Carlo on the security, because I think it's interesting. Um, so, because everything, because if something is um, uh, hackable in principle, it doesn't mean that it can be hacked. I mean, super. He says super sophisticated attack vectors that involve perhaps like you know really expensive equipment on a moving uh, van or or um, truck might not work, right? So so there is that again the kind of threat modeling and and how does this thing actually you know the, how is it deployed in the field where where does it live and so on. So I think you know we could talk about this for hours, but it's really interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, the topic of security and hardware security. Uh, but with that, I wanted to, I'm conscious of time and I wanted to kind of wrap up and uh, uh, give you a chance, you guys to like, just say last words, last comments, uh, and then we'll close. Chichi, you wanna, you wanna go ahead first? Okay, so yeah, Pebble Tracker actually is the uh, first uh, uh, secure hardware instance uh, we, 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 yeah, we are building for developers and also dedicated designed. Uh, to yeah, you can do all kinds of hacking. Uh, yeah, either you are a security researcher, uh, IoT uh, yeah, IoT hobbyist. Uh, you can do all kind of customization uh, you want. Also, yeah, it's a uh, it's a nice combination with a uh, with a blockchain uh, by in, uh, by introducing a different kind of token economics. Uh, it's re it will be really fine. Uh, finally, final note. Uh, I think uh, let's build the decentralized future together. There you go. Love it. <laughs> Robert loves that one. I will. Uh, I will root for that every day. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Jinjin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my my pitch is just you know help us. Uh, you know, this is a very community oriented project, right? You know, uh, we've been open source since day one, and our goal. You know, we've really been heads down building for the past three years, and now the platform is ready to a point where we're actually connecting real hardware to the blockchain. And I can't explain, you know, what the impact of that on the crypto industry is going to be. I think blockchain users don't necessarily understand uh, the, the impact of connecting the physical and digital worlds, but this is exactly what IoT has always been about, right? So I think that IoT is gonna really facilitate some interesting connections between blockchain developers and IoT developers. And there's a big Venn diagram of benefits uh, when we do combine those things. So whether you're a blockchain developer, or IoT developer, we invite you to join our community. We invite you to talk with you know, all of our uh, developers that are going to be building these projects. And um, we just really want you guys to participate. And uh, we don't know everything either, right? I think the, the world, the imagination can run wild as far as what types of uh, decentralized data collectives or decentralized use cases can be enabled once we have full trust. So uh, that's what I want to leave it at. Really, thank you guys for the invite. We had a great time chatting with you guys. I'm going to share one last time here uh, the crowd supply link. So for those of you who are interested in getting a Pebble, we talked about it a lot today. Cruise on down to that crowd supply link. 
Every single resource that we've shared today will be available in the description. And we'll try to also get Larry and Jinjin's uh, information, uh, you know, Twitter information and stuff like that to include down there as well. If you haven't already liked the video, please smash that like button and um, subscribe to the ARM Software Developer YouTube channel uh, once this stream ends. Uh, Alessandro, I'll hand it over to you to close out. One last thank you to Jinjin and Larry. Thank you so much. It's just been a pleasure. I'm, I'm going to be reaching out to you on the side uh, to talk about more, more about this kind of stuff. We'd love to. We'd yep. love to. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jinjin and Larry. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure to have you guys on the show. And uh, and thank you to my co-host Robert for being awesome as usual. And to all the to all the watchers, thank you. Uh, it's been a, a fun a fun episode, and uh, I learned a lot myself. So uh, you know, I hope you did too. And thank you so much all for watching. And until next time, bye. Thanks, bye. guys.